lead you. This morning, I want to um, reset the table, as it were, for what we've been talking about in terms of the ministry of this place. And uh, I've asked you to turn to Philippians 1, and please, you know, just stay there. But in your notes, I've also included John 20, which was our theme text for last year. And I want to read that to you again, just by way of a reintroduction. It says, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. It is this last phrase, verse 22, receive the Holy Spirit, that we will be discussing in great earnest for the rest of this year. The resurrection of Christ gives legitimacy to our ministry. His love motivates our ministry. His peace captivates the lives of his children. And his breath, his spirit, must empower us. In the same way that your physical breath gives life to your, to your physical body, so too the breath of the Spirit gives life to the body of Christ. It's what allows us to live and breathe and move and have our being. We are in this together. Amen. God has chosen that we will live and serve in this place and at this time for his eternal purposes and by his sovereign design. It is a wonderful grace to be allowed to participate in his ministry. That's why the Philippian letter, where Paul says to the church, and this has been our text uh, for most of this year, I thank my God every time I remember you, Paul said. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. Please say that phrase with me that's underlined on the screen. Your partnership in the gospel. Let's say it one more time. Your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you for your word again. Help us today. Help us today. Help us today. I thank you in Christ's precious name. And those who agreed said amen. Going back again to verse 5 for a moment. Your partnership in the gospel. Um, you know, in marketing, in politics, in branding, in business, they, they speak of things like messaging a great deal. And the Church of Jesus Christ in the United States has gotten off message. We have the greatest message ever given, the gospel. We have the most beautiful philosophy ever shared, the gospel. We have the most transformative grace ever appropriated to humanity, the gospel. We have the remedy and the solution that is the remedy and solution to all things, the gospel. But yet the church of Jesus Christ has gotten off the message of the gospel. We've gotten on to the message of politics. We've gotten on to the message of entertainment. We've gotten on to the message of business. We've gotten on to the message of benevolence, but not gospel benevolence, just so people can, can somehow see our virtuous ways. We've gotten on to all sorts of messages. We have a messaging problem. It's not that our message is the problem. It's that we don't embrace the message. Paul was not interested in their partnership as it pertained to their kindness. That was great. But that's not what he was joyful in prayer about. The fact that they had supported him personally was not what he was joyful in prayer about, although the Philippian letter is a thank you letter. He was joyful because they had partnered in the gospel. 
the church of Jesus Christ, I am very convinced of this, and in fact, I'm willing to give the last however many years I have of my life to this. We must be unquestionably, unquenchably focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the only remedy ever given for humanity. It is the only remedy ever given for a fallen and a broken world. It is the only remedy that God has ever shared that said this can change everything. It doesn't matter who Caesar is. It doesn't matter who a king is. It doesn't matter who a monarch is. It doesn't matter if Pontius Pilate is the governor. It doesn't matter if Nero is the Caesar. It doesn't matter what anything else is going on. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the transformative grace given to humanity. But, but when we don't believe that, you say, oh, I believe that, Pastor. What causes you to worry? That tells you what you believe. What causes you to be angry? That tells you what you believe. What brings sorrow to your heart? That tells you what you believe. What brings joy to your spirit? That tells you what you believe. What brings peace to your mind? That tells you what you believe. We can all say the right stuff. You've been at this long enough. I can say the right stuff. What do we believe? What do we believe? We exist to do the ministry of Christ. We exist to do this ministry in his love. We exist to do the ministry for his glory. And we can only do these things by his power. If we do not embrace this truth, the Lord will find someone who will. You and I have been planted in the city of Oakland for God's purposes. You and I have been planted in the Bay Area of California for God's purposes. You and I have been called to serve for God's purposes. To bring him glory, to minister in his love, to bring honor and to bring the power of God into the hearts and lives of people. The power of God only comes through the sake and the ministry of the gospel. I'm not ashamed, Paul said, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. So here we stand today, and we have a lot of work to do. The Lord has blessed the ministry of this place that for, 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 you know, almost three quarters of a century. That's a long time. That's even long for me. That for almost three quarters of a century, this place has been here and been in the city of Oakland, and been in ministry, born in revival, gone through trials and tribulations, gone through difficulties, gone through transitions, gone through even the death of its founder, gone through all sorts of things, and yet here we are. Here we are. By God's grace and by God's mercy, but to what end? I want to speak to you from my heart today. I want you to know just how serious I am about this. And just how serious I feel we need to be about these things. The great promise of our Lord and Jesus Christ is that he will build his church. He's the architect. He's the designer. Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. His great commandment, number two in your notes, and his great commission outline for us his vision. His commandment is that we would love God with all of our heart and that we would love our neighbors as ourselves. His great commission is that we would go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and that we would teach them, Matthew 28, 20. 
teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that the Lord has given to us and to be sure that the Lord will be with us always to the very end of the age. These are the instructions of the Savior. This is the table we have set so far this year. Number three in your notes, this is the universal vision of Jesus for his church, that we would be a people who worship, that we would be a people who serve, that we would be people who go after the lost, that we would be a people who bring them together in fellowship, and that we would train them, that we would disciple them. This is what God has said to do to everybody, the whole body of Christ. Doesn't matter if you're in Sri Lanka, doesn't matter if you're in India, doesn't matter if you're in Europe, doesn't matter if you're in Africa, doesn't matter if you're in Australia, doesn't matter if you're in Asia, doesn't matter if you're in the Americas. Every part of the body of Christ must do these five things. And wherever two or three of us gather together, that's the church. The presence of the Lord is there. When we gather together, we must gather for worship. We must serve one another. We must go after those who are lost. We must be, bring the body together in fellowship and in love and in support and in, and in character building and training. We must do these things. This is what the Lord has told us to do universally. But in addition to this, there's the unique mission that the Lord has for this congregation. The vision is universal. The vision is macro. The mission is unique. The mission is micro. The Lord sent Dr. Patton here three quarters of a century ago with a unique mission. The Lord sent me here 12 years ago with a unique mission. Now, being the new kid on the block, I had to kind of figure out what the mission was a little bit for this place. And that took me some time, frankly. There was a lot to think about, a lot to work about, a lot to go through. You had to figure out, you know, where the landmines were, by the way. Some I found by, oh, there's one. Some I found by stepping on it. But nonetheless... The vision and the mission of Christ give to us a sense of obligation. Romans 1.14, Paul said, I have a great sense of obligation to people in our culture. You see, my friends, there's a reason the Lord has you here. And if you don't get anything else out of today's message, would you please get that? There's a reason the Lord has you here. Oakland is a unique setting. The Bay Area of California is a unique setting. It's different. I'm from, I'm from the L.A. area. This is much different than the Los Angeles area. I know you're all going to say, well, it's because it's much better. I, 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 I know you think that. Let's just say it's different. Every area is different. Los Angeles... You know, everybody makes fun of people in Los Angeles because they, they're, they're fancy cars. They're, oh, you're so shallow. You have such fancy cars. Yeah, everybody's got to have a nice car. It's because people in L.A. live in their car. <laughs> so, so their cars are their apartments, basically. And so that's different. It's different. In L.A., you, you talk about, you talk about where, where, where something is. When you come up here, people say, well, where, how far is that? Oh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's 10 miles. It's 12 miles. It's 22 miles. It's, that's not how we talk in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, we say it's 27 minutes. How far away is that? It's an hour. It's an hour. It's 75 minutes. Everything is in terms of time. That's how you, that, because, because everywhere you go, it's, it's, well, you got to take that free. If you take that free, oh, that's just horrible. And, and that's just the way it is. San Diego's even different. San Diego, they have such perfect weather, they don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> Fresno's even different. Fresno's so hot in the summertime, they just leave. They just go anywhere. They just go everywhere they can because it's so hot. Northern California is even different yet. So California has a good five different regions of which the Bay Area is its own region. It's kind of its own state. Then if you go to Utah, if you go to Nevada, if you go to Oregon, now, you know, all the hippies and stuff. If you go, I'm sure I'm offended my friends in Oregon. <laughs> you go wherever, wherever you go, it's all different. Arizona, where my parents, we just moved them from Arizona back to near my son in Los Angeles area. Okay, it's different in Arizona. Texas is different. The Midwest is different. The United States is different. And the Lord didn't call you any of those places. He called you here. 
Okay? The gospel doesn't change. The vision doesn't change. But the mission is unique. And you and I must understand we have a great sense of obligation to the people here. The Lord has called us to be salt and to be light here. And wherever other places he will, he will deem that our sphere of influence must go. The stakes are high. The consequences are eternal. We do not have the luxury of spiritual pacifism. We do not have the luxury of just being about what we want. Now is when it gets a little harder. I just want you to hear me today. I honestly don't need you to agree with me. You and the Lord have to deal with this. You don't have to agree with me. He and I are having conversations ourselves. Church is not about what we want. Church is not about what we like. We don't own this thing. This is his work. This is his doing. His love has to be the first and last word in everything we do. Amen. How much can I tell you this? When I was younger, people would say, well, we have to have church in this time or this hour in this place in this way. And you kind of listen to that because you're younger. And now I'm older and I still have those voices in my own mind because I, there's certain things I like. There's certain stuff I like. There's certain ways of doing things that I appreciate. And I understand that and I get that. I told you one time when I was first started the church in Southern California, I had a, a sister call me and say, well, what kind of worship do you have? And I said, well, it's the kind I like. <laughs> that was my great answer. That was my spiritual depth. It was, it's the kind I like. I don't know. What, what, I, didn't, I had no idea what she was talking about. I just said, it's the kind I like. But as I'm older now, I'm at a place in my life and I'm at a place in my journey in ministry where I just want to do God's will. Amen. If Thursday night at 11.30 p.m. would get the most lost people into church, that's when we'd have church. How broken are we for the fact that souls aren't going to the kingdom of God? How hurt are we by the fact that there are people who are lost and entering a Christless eternity? Not strangers we've never heard of. People we love. People we know. People we go to school with people we go to work with, people who live and, and next door to us and across the street from us and on the other side of us. I was convicted this morning as I left for church. My neighbor was crawling under his car, <coughs> working on his car. So I said a few words in passing and I was thinking, you know, I, I wish I could crawl under his car and help him. Of course, me crawling under the car would be of no help whatsoever. <laughs> the Lord did not gift me, bless me, or gave me the capacity to learn how to fix things. I'm not very good at fixing things. I'm terribly good at breaking things, but I'm not very good at fixing things. 
But here's what I was convicted about. I thought, you know, I, I, I probably should just at least go over and hand him a wrench or some such thing. Just engage in conversation. Just, just be a neighbor. And as I drove off, I thought of those things. Because you see, I was too busy. I had too many other things to do. I had too many other places to engage. I had, I had too many other thoughts and too many other things that were demanding my attention. The vast majority of the people I deal with are Christians. Probably 98%. For me, for me to engage the loss, I have to do it intentionally. Because most of the people that work in our kind of business are Christians. And I wonder how often we look at the church simply as a refuge from the lost. When the lost need to see us as a refuge from brokenness. Amen. So here we are. We've begun to identify elements of the mission that the Lord has given to us. And it's unique. The mission is the scope and the locale. It's the way things are done. We've identified strategic pathways, and I've talked to you about this, and I know I'm not going to belabor the point. The Lord has blessed us. He has blessed us unbelievably. We've come out of seven years total of Really existential crisis, the kind of crisis that most of you won't know about, nor should you know about, because it's just stuff we have to deal with. Crisis about whether or not we could even afford to stay in Oakland. Whether or not we could even afford to stay here on this campus. The Lord has taken our debt down from $14 million to half that in seven years. Thank the Lord. I can report to you today that this core campus is debt free. There's not a penny owed on this church. There's not a penny owed on why if there's not a penny owed on any of these educational buildings. That's the Lord's doing. The auxiliary campus is where the debt is held now. Auxiliary campus is where we collect rents too. And so, you know, there, it, it basically pays, helps to pay for itself. But we're not in the business of maintaining mortgages. We're in the business of reducing and eliminating these things. But the Lord's done this. But there was a moment in time, even, even albeit briefly, where we had to give thought, can we even afford to stay here? What's the Lord doing? What's the Lord bringing to pass? We've come through that. It doesn't mean we don't have crises, doesn't mean we don't have battles, we do. But we've come through existential crisis and the Lord has helped us. We've begun to identify, and the board and the, the, both the church council and the CECA board of directors, we've identified these ministry lanes, the way I talk about it, and that's because I'm from Los Angeles and it's easy for me to think of things that way. There's a slow lane, there's a fast lane, there's a mediocre lane, and there's all lanes, you know. And so the, the point is that you're going the same direction. We're all going the same direction, but there's various avenues of ministry. And one of the great avenues of ministry that the Lord gave you from the beginning was the ministry of education. This is something that the Lord gave to you very, very early on, letter I in your, in your notes, education. Dr. Patton's revival ended in the 40s with a great altar call for those that would want to be trained for Christian ministry. Some 300 people came forward in that altar call. And out of that was birthed the Oakland Bible Institute and from that the various educational ministries. And as we move forward, what we're praying for is that we, we already have child care, but we're praying and we're wanting to begin a new preschool. Would you please pray about that? We actually need more space than we currently have. We need workers into that particular harvest field. 
We have partnerships with some charter schools, but we want to expand the, uh, the footprint of the campus and put those in a little bit different position so that there's the core campus and the auxiliary campus. We want to see an international school of the arts develop. We want to see a school for special needs children develop and families. We want the higher education and pastoral school of leadership and consortium to take place, a school of community transformation. We're praying for not only discipleship, but even other areas of ministry that, that I'm not prepared to talk to you about today. But the Lord is not just, not just refocusing our energies and education. He's expanding them. And he's expanding them into places of the earth that we hadn't imagined 10 years ago. He's expanding them into places that we hadn't dreamt of 10 years ago. The Lord has given us this lane of education, this ministry of education. We don't do what everyone else does necessarily, but not everyone else does what we do in education. It's our mission. It's our mission. The idea of pastoral care and nurture and fellowship ministries. These are headed up by Reverend Fears, but there's a, a team that, that does these things, Reverend, Reverend Beebe and, and Reverend Minerva and others, who go into prayer ministries, pastoral care and visitation. My prayer is that, that we expand this. You know, prayer has always been central to this ministry here. There's a prayer meeting every day at 6.30 in the prayer chapel. There aren't a whole lot of churches that have a prayer meeting every day. This church does. Every day in that prayer chapel, that prayer chapel is open. Not, I don't know the exact time, but it's when security opens it, it's when security closes it. But it's open for at least 14 hours or so a day. People come in from all walks of life. We see them stop, walk on our campus, enter into that prayer chapel, write down those needs that we pray about every Sunday morning in the prayer basket. And people are praying about every night in the, in the prayer meeting. And others go in there and they just go through those needs and begin to pray because that is central to who we are. It's central to the ministry of this place. The care and visitation ministries Reverend Fears and others are involved not only in, 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 serve, in, in ministry service to our congregation, but they're involved in ministry service to chapels. And, 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 and it serve, Reverend Fears serves as chaplains in, in hospitals and these other places. The Lord has given us these things. And by the grace of God, Reverend and others have stewarded these things. My prayer is that we expand small group ministries. Reverend Beebe has spoken about the, the men's Bible study and the ladies' Bible study, and then the young people meet together, and then the, the development of even some of these worship teams. But my prayer is that we have more multiplicity of home fellowships, and that we reach into rest homes and hospitals and prisons, that we reach into benevolence. You see in our community, one of the things that we do is we adopt families and we reach out to people that aren't in our church. Networking and partnering, Dr. Abe and Sister Patty doing all sorts of things within the Fruitvale community. Networking and partnering and, and things that even others wouldn't, wouldn't consider quote unquote spiritual, but they're community driven. Core training, you know, we are going to have an earthquake. You know that, right? If you don't know that, you shouldn't be living here. We, you know that. We offer training and things like that to the whole community to reach out and to minister. But I'm praying that we open a counseling ministry. I, we have a person already in mind who's going to serve as the director of this ministry. We just need the proper funding and proper development of this ministry. That we can reach into the community with, with felt needs and, and, and different needs. Because this is pastoral care and nurture. It's something the Lord has given us to do. Worship arts, number three. Highly advanced arts ministry is a tool to reach not only Oakland and the Bay Area, but to reach the Far East. Music, pageants, visual arts, graphic arts, dramatic arts. I'm praying that we have a performing arts building on campus. I am praying that over the next 50 years, you say, Pastor, 50 years. 
How many of you are old enough to remember 50 years ago? I want to see some hands. How many of you wish you couldn't? <laughs> you don't remember everything that happened every day. And some of you younger people are looking at me silly. All right. Can you remember 10 years ago? Can you remember five years ago? You don't remember everything that happens on every day. But you remember the highlights. And so when I speak of 50 years to come or 20 years to come or 10 years to come, I'm not speaking of every moment of every day. I'm speaking of the highlights. The way you look back in memory, candidly, is the way the Lord allows me to look forward. And that's what I do by his grace. My prayer for this place is that we have a highly developed education and arts ministry with the gospel at its core and the gospel at its center and that that be what we are known for even within the secular community. That that is one of the ways in which we do evangelism is through the ministries of education and the ministries of art. Don't get me wrong, going door to door has value. Preaching on the street corner has value. Giving, having big crusades has value. But one of the ways in which we win the lost is through education and through the arts. But because education and the arts have become so secularized, I'm telling you, secularism is a religion. And it's pervasive in this culture pervasive in the Bay Area. Because these religions, this religion, this false religion of secularism is out there and is pervasive in the arts and pervasive in education, you and I have to be very, very conscientious and intentional about bringing the gospel into the arts and bringing the gospel into our education. Our entire curricular structure from preschool through, the, through higher education must have the cross at its center. Our arts must have the cross at its center. Everything we do must have the gospel at its center. And then because we're going to put the gospel at the center, because the cross is going to be at the center, we must be exceptional at what we do. Some of you come from backgrounds. Now listen, you don't have to look very far to see that I don't come from that background. But some of you come from backgrounds of ethnicity, of race, of gender, in which you had to work twice as hard to get half the credit. Okay? I understand that to the best that I've, someone in my position can understand that. I don't claim to understand it the way that those who've experienced it understand it. Okay? But I understand the reality of it for many of you. What I'm trying to share with you is the church must take that same posture. The secular world is going to look at us with a narrow mindset and a sneer and a mock. We have to be twice as good to get half the credit from them. And it's not by chance that many of you have had that particular life experience because God's going to redeem it, hallelujah, and use it for his glory and for his honor because you have an experience that the church needs to understand. I'm trying to tell you some truth here today. So when we do education, it can't just be as good as the public schools, it has to far exceed them. When we do arts, it can't be as good as Hollywood or as good as San Francisco Symphony or as good as this group or as good as that group. It has to be exceptionally beyond them. Second Corinthians 13. 
aim for perfection. Now, here's something else that, this, that includes this. Now, I see the clock. I'm running out of time. So here we go. I didn't even get back to zero. I didn't even get back to my, I have a little marker that tells me where to go. Didn't even get there, but that's okay. Fifty years from now, I will be 105. Please don't take this wrong and please don't take this as a threat to the Lord or anyone else. I hope I'm dead and gone. Unless, unless I'm like Sister Connie. <laughs> Whose mind is still there. <laughs> If the Lord graces me with that, okay, I'll stick around. But beyond that, the, the, way, I, the, way, the way I'm feeling right now, I'm thinking, yeah, that's not going to look good, all right? <laughs> that said, that said, my dad just turned uh, last Saturday, or yeah, the Saturday before Easter, my dad just turned 84, okay, 84 years of age. So that's 29 years from now, 28 years from now for me. But my dad just turned 84. My youngest granddaughter, my little one, she's a year and a half. She'll be, she'll be two in a few months here. When she is my dad's age, it'll be the year 2100. When my granddaughter is my father's age, it will be the year 2100. That means I stand before you and I stand in the middle of my family with one hand here and another hand there. My dad, born in 1934, will have, let's just say that all things being equal, will have a great grand daughter who lives to the year 2100. That's a 166 year span of life that I get to touch. I can touch my dad and I can touch my granddaughter because the Lord allowed me to live in this moment in this time. That's 160 years of human history. Will I live 160 years? No. But that's 160 years of human history that I get to touch, that I'm called to steward, that I'm called to resource, that I'm called to speak into, that I'm called to bless, that I'm called to encourage, that I'm called to lift up. Now listen to me, church. I'm trying to teach you something here. God has called you and I not just to live for today, not just to live for tomorrow, but to pass on something to our children's 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 children. That is beyond anything we can imagine. So I look at every day with how it's going to impact not just tomorrow, but a dozen tomorrows. I've given you the two pathways, the two of the lanes right now. Education, pastoral care, and worship. Three of them. To do these well, we have to position ourselves to pass on ministry. We have to position ourselves to pour ministry into young people and release them into ministry. If we're not willing to do that, it doesn't mean we get to sit on the pew. That's the last thing the kingdom calls you to do. But it means we must not make the mistake. We must not make the mistake 
we must not make the mistake of expecting a person who's 25 years old to have achieved in their mind and their understanding the vibrancy of someone 55. And, they ha- and, and saying subconsciously, well, they have to have that ability before we release ministry to them or through them. Then what's going to happen is we just won't have anybody to release the ministry to. Our young people will make mistakes. They're supposed to. That's how they learn. You look at David at 30. You look at Joseph at 30. You look at Jesus at 30. These were young people changing their world. Now, Joseph is sort of a type of Christ in the Old Testament. They used to do a lot of type teaching. And Jesus is perfect. But David... David did a whole lot of fouling up after 30. David did a whole lot of fouling up when he was like my age. If we, I, we don't put novices in position, of, I get that. Okay? But on the same token, if we don't release ministry to young people, we will not have a ministry to release. Because it will die with us. For every Moses, there must be a Joshua. For every David, there must be a Solomon. For every Jesus, there must be 12. None of which were as good as Jesus. But he released it nonetheless. For every Paul, there must be a Timothy. This is the way of the kingdom. And what I'm saying to you, my friends, whom I love dearly, dearly, is that this pastor is going to intentionally do that. Because we must. We must. Now to my young friends, you have to have more Jesus on the line than you currently do. You need to start going to that prayer meeting and listening to how the elders pray. Because you haven't learned how to pray. All due respect. You haven't learned how to seek the face of the Lord yet. You've depended upon the skill of your mind, and I'll grant that you're smarter than most, and maybe the most educated generation in the history of the world. You certainly have access to more knowledge than anyone ever had. I sure couldn't Google an answer in class. But you've not learned how to pray. You've not learned how to seek the face of God. You've not learned how to tarry. You've not learned how to fast. You've not learned how to anguish yet. And let me share something from a middle-aged man. Well, I'm older than middle-aged now, but from an old guy's heart. Either you will do this intentionally or God will bring about circumstances that cause it. You can fall on the rock and be broken. Or the rock can fall on you and you'll be crushed. But there's not another way around it. You either intentionally fall on the rock of Christ and allow yourself to be broken in humility. Why is prayer so important? Because it is an acknowledgement that you cannot do what needs to be done. That's why. Brother Jesse can sing. These young men and women can play instruments. They can all sing and do all these things. They're smart. They got these little handheld things that they, you know, and all that stuff. And I can't figure out for my life. 
The danger with that is you think you can do what needs to be done for the kingdom, and you can't. Only God. Only God. And your grandparents came out of a tribulation of a depression. They came out of the tribulation of a war. They came out of the anguish of civil rights. They came out of the, the, the barriers where some couldn't even vote because of their skin color. They fought through all of these things and knew they couldn't overcome without God. You must get that mindset. Because if you don't, the Lord will allow circumstances that cause it. You can choose to be broken or crushing will take place. Now, here's the good news. Even when you're broken, God puts the pieces back together and the whole is better than the, than the, the sum of the parts. But even if you're crushed, he takes dust and makes a new man. Either way, you come out on the other side gold. Because God's, God's God. The question is, how will you get there? So you need to start getting in prayer meeting. You need to start, stop making fun of grandma and grandpa because they can't do the little toy computer thing that you can do and start following them because they know how to get hold of the throne of God and you don't. But grandma and grandpa, we have to release the ministry to them because it's young people who go to war. And we're in the middle of a spiritual war, and it's the Lamb's War. And we need workers into this harvest field. This is why God, listen to me carefully, church. This is why God gave you the ministry that has to do with education and gave you the ministry that has to do with arts is because his intention was always that this would be a place that reproduces young people full of the fervor of God. took me a long time to get there but that's the bottom line today the ministry of the lord for christian cathedral the ministry of the lord for Patton, the Patton ministries the ministry of the lord for this campus was that you and i would reproduce young men and young women who are full of the fervor of god doesn't mean people my age don't have value. Doesn't mean people older than me don't have value. Of course we have value. Who pours the knowledge and the depth and the wisdom into this generation? That's our task. But it's not that they sit back until we die. Because that's not the way of the kingdom. That's not the way it's supposed to be. that for a spring break message <laughs> this is my heart today this is my heart today stand with me please